Professor Perek-Rizek, he'll be talking a little bit, about, and this is a bit of a continuation, perhaps, from Prof. Bofat's lecture about trauma resuscitation and should we be using whole blood or the components and how do we actually manage the protocols, MTPs or component therapy. He's a trauma general surgeon and an intensive cross trainer as an intensivist as well at McGill University Health Center in Canada. He's the He's the chief of the Division of Trauma Surgery there, um, and he is both trauma-trained as well as um, ICU-trained, um, as such making him the perfect speaker for this topic. And very significantly, he's also the co-director of the Center of Global Surgery at McGill. Um, Professor Zeng, floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so I'm going to speak about uh, transfusional therapy and resuscitation, and I think it's been very nicely introduced by Professor Bofford and also some of the technical applications that uh, Dr. Demours uh, spoke about in terms of how we can affect uh, hemorrhage control. But I'll talk about how we can manage uh, blood component therapy uh, and touch on whole blood in how we navigate uh, the resuscitation of these patients while we are trying to gain hemorrhage control in the bleeding patient. So I have uh, no major disclosures except that I'm a surgeon, so I enjoy uh, achieving hemorrhage control and as opposed to continuously resuscitating patients. And although I'm not a very good baker, I think the analogy of baking to how we navigate our blood products is very um, appropriate. Uh, baking is based upon ratios, how you mix a ratio of very standard ingredients um, creates very different products. And I think it's the same way that I think of how we use ratios in using our blood bank products that are available to us. Um, and you have to pick the right products in the right sequence um, in order to, to get the right result. So try not to be as much of a baker as a surgeon, but uh, my baking results are usually very poor. Um, what is very clear from the literature going back now over a decade is that um, using a more equal ratio of the blood product components that are available to us um, results in better outcomes for patients who are significantly hemorrhaging. So the using more plasma and platelets and fibrinogen related products, which are differently managed in different areas in the world in terms of how fibrinogen products are packaged, but whatever is available to you, whether they're discrete fibrinogen products or whether they're mixed into cryoprecipitate as they are in North America, um, using plasma, platelets, fibrinogen products, and red cell products in a combination that it results in more equal ratios results in better outcomes. But if you think about that, aren't we simply just reconstituting the whole blood? Um, those ratio product management strategies have been shown to, again, result in significant outcome differences. So the old days when on, I was training, uh, when we used um, more red cells than the other component products um, was a relatively poor strategy as we failed to reconstitute the whole blood that the patient is losing. And again, the patient is not losing component products, the patient is losing whole blood. So that's that philosophy of being a good baker and reconstituting in the right ratios those component products. And there's a significant amount of data uh, that indicates that that is a significantly superior strategy. So it's very important, no matter what is available to you or how your blood product um, resources are available to you, that you find a way to reconstitute the components in an equal ratios. Well, what's the problem with trying to do that? Typical practice for many of us who are involved in clinical trauma care is your 3 a.m. trauma. 22-year-old male involved in a motor vehicle crash. His blood pressure is 80 over 50. He's significantly tachycardic, has an altered Glasgow uh, coma score. Uh, he has a flail chest. He's putting out some blood from the chest. He has a pelvis fracture and a positive fast. So you have multi-potential sources of hemorrhage in this very unwell patient. What are you going to do? Do you think this patient needs blood products? Yes. No. Hopefully, yes. Uh, let's wait and see how he does, um, or quick page the hematologist on call. I don't know about in your centers, but um, I love my hematologists. They're critical to how we navigate our blood banking and our uh, management of these patients afterwards if they've received complex blood product replacements and whole system blood replacements, uh, but they don't tend to answer their pages at three in the morning very efficiently in my uh, experience. 
and we don't want to replace crystalloid. We don't want to wait and see. This patient is not losing crystalloid. They're losing blood products, which contains coagulation factors, has been, has been well described already today, um, but also oxygen carrying capacity in the red cell hemoglobin. So, you know, this is not a, this is a, a grave error in what we know today about resuscitation to be util, utilizing crystalloids. And although there are delays in many systems in getting access rapidly to blood products, it's absolutely critical that you find ways to increase the efficiency of access to blood products for these patients, because the more crystalloid you give to them, the higher their death rate is going to be, regardless of how good you are at that ultimate hemorrhage control. Is this patient already anticoagulated on arrival, given the fact that they are likely having an exsanguinating event? Yes, no, or let's see, let's see if the lab tests are back yet that we sent. But often in my experience at three in the morning, oops, they're still sitting there on the counter and haven't even gone to the lab yet. So we don't have the luxury of time uh, to wait on complex laboratory evaluation of these patients. We have to take their clinical presentation, our, our best estimate at what is going on here in a major trauma case that this patient is having a major exsanguinating event. Um, we need to design hemorrhage control, but we also need to design our resuscitation as we move along the path to rapid hemorrhage control in a very coordinated fashion. So then what does this patient require? Four units of PAC cells, six units of packed red cells, and three units of FFP, or some other combination of products, or again, should we page the hematologist and see what we ought to do, or maybe we should just page the baker, who's probably up at three in the morning, and decide what ratio we should use to make bread or to make pancakes. I want five fresh frozen plasma right now, please. If we haven't coordinated that with the blood bank, unfortunately, in many environments in the world, your plasma is frozen solid. So if you need it immediately, you will not be getting it immediately because it needs to be thawed. So again, coordinating how one accesses more rapidly the products that you currently have available in your blood banking system is critical to the achieving better outcomes for these patients because it's our use of those component therapies, which is how most of us have access to blood products, uh, how well we've coordinated that access to that array of blood products is going to determine how good we are going to be at resuscitating this patient while we achieve hemorrhage control. So in our system, we've moved to having continuously available thawed plasma so that we can have rapid access to it when needed, but use it on a regular basis with our general use in our large hospital so that we don't have wastage. And in fact, we've had less wastage since we thawed the plasma and had at least four to six units of thawed plasma available at all times. So once one package is used, another one is thawed. And so it's immediately available. That's critical to having rapid access and achieving that more equal ratio of component therapy, which is so critical. Here's an example of a massive transfusion guideline. And I would submit to you that at, um, at three in the morning, faced with this scenario, I don't have the time to go through that. I will look like this and I'm very confused and disoriented. So what is absolutely critical is that we go back to a standard ratio set for the initiation of our first box um, of massive transfusion products so that this is coordinated, um, standardized. And when we say I need for this patient at three in the morning with a blood pressure of 80 after a major trauma and failure to resuscitate initially, that I need my massive transfusion protocol, which comes with a standardized kit of relatively equalized ratios of products that are immediately available and tightly coordinated with my blood bank team. And they are really part of our trauma team. And we work very closely with them to make sure we're coordinating this well so that we can become good bakers. So the other thing that I think Professor Boffer discussed very elegantly early on is that please don't forget to stop the bleeding. The resuscitation is not the end point. It's a bridge to get us to be able to sustain the patient so that we can get them into Scott's Raptor suite and achieve hemorrhage control rapidly and efficiently. And my favorite uh, tool to do that is silk. So it's very simple, achieve pressure and obtain surgical control of hemorrhage where required. So identify the target and then operate on that target or intervene in some way using a combination of interventional radiology and surgery to achieve rapid hemorrhage control. But along the way, a better organized blood product resuscitation is critical. 
So it's important to keep up to date, make sure that that is managed with your teams and your institutions very elegantly with your hematology blood banking team so that you're constantly making sure that you are having rapid and timely access to that array of blood products that you have available to you at this moment in time. So going a la carte and selecting something off the shelf. Oh, I think we need three units of pack cells. And then 20 minutes later, we should, well, we should get some FFP or we maybe have we given him the platelets yet? What's the fibrinogen level? Not at the initial setting. It's a tablet dote, a standardized protocol that's initiated and flagged immediately with the patient in extremis so that we can access it very quickly and move that component therapy along very quickly and efficiently in a predefined fashion, and also turn it off quickly once we have achieved hemorrhage control. It's about that teamwork with all of these team members doing this in an integrated fashion, which is extremely important to coordinate. So what is most important is thoughtfully applying the current knowledge and defining the plan offline with all those players. I can't tell you how many meetings I've had with our transfusion committee to make sure that we put in place the correct protocol and that we manage, maintain, and quality control as we move along in a prospective fashion, how we are accessing those blood products so that we are giving that best resuscitation to that patient, again, while we are affecting hemorrhage control. So you must have a massive transfusion protocol in your institution if you are a center that receives complex trauma patients that require resuscitation as part of their hemorrhage control plan. Um, it's really, really critical. But as I said, aren't we just reconstituting whole blood? What is, should we not be using whole blood as part of the strategic approach? And in most environments in the world, we moved away a very long time ago for technical and logistic reasons for the, to, because of the facility to manage and store components and use them differentially for elective use of blood products rather than storing whole blood, which is less sustainable and more complex to maintain. And then yes, less utilized in the elective setting where the majority of our blood banking products are utilized. But in the hemorrhage scenario, we're just reconstituting whole blood. So why aren't we just using whole blood? Should we? Is there any data to suggest that that would be advantageous? Here you can see a breakdown of some a standardized structure of component therapy and what that looks like in terms of the hematocrit. Notice it's at 29% in stored packed red cells. Coagulation activity, typically around 65% in your plasma products. And when you get your fibrinogen products, usually especially in cryoprecipitate in the North American model of banking, uh, we only get about 750 milligrams of fibrinogen in that product. Whereas if you compare it to whole blood, you're getting 38 to 50 percent hematocrit. You're getting a lot more platelet activity, which is usually fresher because of the restrictions of storage of whole blood. Coagulation capacity is at 100 percent, and you get double the dose of fibrinogen in that product. So you can see why there's an attraction to going back in time, as it were, and re-navigating how to utilize whole blood in our blood banking strategies for the bleeding patient. Is that feasible technically? Yes, it is. Is it a challenge? Yes, it is. So, but you can see here on the right, you see a package of whole blood and on the left, you see a package of packed red cells. One just looks better than the other, I would submit. And time is our enemy. So I think if you think about where the exsanguinating patient dies, they, the golden hour is a bit of a myth. We really have golden minutes in the exsanguinating patient. So the more rapid we can get access to blood product replacement and more rapidly move that patient to hemorrhage control environments, um, we're gonna achieve better outcomes. Is that borne out by any data? Um, so here's some very interesting data from a colleague of, of all of ours, Dr. Jenkins, who works in at the University of Texas in San Antonio or used to. And this is where um, they looked at sort of where, do, where can we affect uh, more rapid access to blood product replacement um, and that, in their opinion, was in the pre-hospital field. So they looked in a very large territory in a swath of Texas. They looked at, um, can we get whole blood delivered to the patient at the scene and in transit to the facility to effect a more rapid onset of blood product replace, replacement in an environment where you cannot do um, blood typing and screening. So you use O blood, low titer, um, for the transfusion strategy. And this low titer group O whole blood in emergency situations and specifically in the pre-hospital setting um, is very appealing. 
So what's their experience in implementing this in this context? Did it achieve any results that were interesting? So in the first 60 days of using this in the pre-hospital sector, in this environment in Texas, they had 32 patients who received low titer, O positive whole blood. Six of them died. The mortality rate was around just under 20% for that cohort of massively exsanguinating patients coming out of the pre-hospital sector identified as such. What they noticed was a 50% decrease in mortality from historical controls for the emergency release transfusion um, and projected then to save, given their volume of work in the state of Texas, uh, 12 to 14 lives per month uh, using this technique in these patients. So would submit that there is an, a very appealing environment to use um, whole blood in certain settings. You can clearly understand how this is very attractive in a military setting um, where you're working with exsanguinating scenarios with a very robust forward team who have certain technical skills in an environment where you have predictably a large number of exsanguinating patients who um, you can access then whole blood to and prolong their capacity to survive to get to definitive care. Can we extrapolate that to the, the civilian sector? Well, this is what this one team was interested in and examined in Texas and seemingly feasible. I would argue to be very careful because it requires a tremendous amount of infrastructure and technical capacity in whatever setting you're gonna decide to deploy something like a whole blood strategy. In the Canadian context right now, we have a national blood banking system um, in Canadian blood services, and we are actively looking at um, creating an environment where we are going to have whole blood available for resuscitation under specific circumstances. And you can imagine when we have multiple casualties at the same time at a trauma center, when we have uh, mass casualty scenarios, or potentially in the pre-hospital setting with great distances that we have to travel sometimes in the Canadian context, for example, this may be um, selectively very, very useful um, as a product to use in our armamentarium of blood banking products. Um, as it stands right now, though, the data still is very scant, and I think the applicability is very complex and very narrow for whole blood use, although very interesting, and I think we will see an expansion of whole blood use for resuscitation in specific settings, and it'd be very interesting to see how we all navigate deploying this in our environments if we, if we think this is the way to go moving forward. But we will always, I'm sure, retain component therapy because of the blood banking logistic restrictions and because of the volume of elective access and use of blood products, which is more often component therapy based. So that in our hospital settings, I think one of the most important aspects to take away here is that you must have a massive transfusion protocol and work very tightly with your blood banking professionals to make sure that it is working very efficiently and that you are able to reconstitute the whole blood elements with a nice array of a balanced resuscitation with different blood products in there, um, which is critical to improving survival in those exsanguinating patients. Um, using thromboelastography will be part of this as we move into a secondary phase of continuing to resuscitate that patient, whether it's in the operating theater or whether it's in the ICU setting, to look at now the individualized needs of that patient with regards to what they have to have and giving more patient-specific determinants of their particular clotting deficiencies and so that we can target things in a secondary resuscitation phase um, once we have achieved hemorrhage control and using selected component therapy, which I think is a very interesting technique to use with thromboelastography, whether it's TEG or Rotom or some other device. And then the whole blood data remains weak, but is very interesting and most likely will become something we see a little bit more of in very selected circumstances and settings where there's a strong benefit to using that whole blood already reconstituted in an environment where we cannot do the testing, like in mass casualties, multiple casualties even, um, uh, more critical urgent settings, and in the pre-hospital sector in environments where they have the technical feasibility of doing that because it is complex. So I thank you for your time and attention.